You're listening to Bible Truth Feed, a podcast by Christadelphianvideo.org for Christadelphians and all those seeking the truth about the Bible message. Join us now as we present our latest episode. Good evening, beloved brothers and sisters in the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, We had read for us not the 24th chapter where this takes place, but the 23rd chapter, and we'll, God willing, be able to explain why. Because really, the marriage of Isaac has everything to do with the reference point of Sarah. And hopefully, we'll see that in just a moment. And we do like to open uh, our classes frequently with the responsibility of of anyone who takes upon them to teach the Word of God. And with that in mind, I uh, simply want to quote Ezra chapter 7, verse 10, where it says, Ezra prepared his heart to seek the law of Yahweh and to do it and to teach Israel statutes and judgments. So that's the requirement for teaching is to actually seek it and study it yourself and to actually do it, as we all know, which is the hardest part, and then to teach others. So upon that introduction, <clears throat> Marriage is a very big subject in scripture, Um, and what we're considering today is Genesis 23 and 24. Both parties in marriage are the foundation of a lot of doctrine in scripture, a lot of it. Song of Solomon is a very good example of that. So the marriage of Abraham's son to Rebekah, we consider in the same light. It is really a prophetic parable, a prophecy full of doctrine. And all of this marriage, as we mentioned before, which is why we had read this chapter, stands related to Sarah. And God willing, we'll see that here in just a moment. We read actually in the parable spoken of by Christ, the kingdom of heaven was like a certain king which made a marriage for his son. And then when you get to the end of the apocalypse, of course, we have the new heavens, new earth, and the John seeing the new city, the holy city, Jerusalem coming down out of heaven prepared as a bride her husband. So the subject matter in the language is beyond the literal in scripture. We all know that. I'm not saying anything that we do not know at this time. So when we read the situation with Sarah, then Isaac and Rebecca and Abraham and his servant, and the things that are coming, we know that they are prophetic of these things. Now, just a quick review, because we did read Sarah, and there's a reference report, uh, there's a reference point here. And that is that Sarah, remember her name was changed like Abraham's, the H added so that she would be a mother of many people, a mother of nations. And that's exactly what the Apostle Paul says in Galatians 4. Not like Hagar, the Egyptian, the Mosaic covenant, the gender's bondage, but she is the Abrahamic, the Jerusalem which is above, the mother of us all. So it's not just to the Jew. The, the Hagar principle of bondage. And then, of course, that was fulfilled when the Gentiles were brought in and that Israel would experience this, that is the natural Jew, and that Jerusalem would be trodden down to the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. And even the Lord said, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation bringing forth fruits. Now, I understand in all of these references, some we've already considered, there's a lot more here than what we've just read. But they're significant statements. The kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation bringing forth fruits. And if we forget to say it in our notes, we want to say it now. Because we've considered Genesis 21, the allegory of Abraham's two sons, Hagar, bonded from Egypt, the law of Moses. Sarah, which was before, and the wife of Abraham before, the Abrahamic covenant, and the mother of us all. Not just making of Hagar, a man, Ishmael, a great nation, that is Israel after the flesh, but Sarah, the mother of both Jew and Gentile. Hagar is now gone from the record. Genesis 22, God willing, that we looked at, she's referenced, I believe, one more time in Genesis 25, but it is simply a reference point to genealogy. 
So I think that's significant, brothers and sisters. She's gone because the sacrifice of Christ took the mosaic away. 70 was coming and he had fulfilled all the law. Hagar's gone. The Jews, as they worshiped under the law, are gone. So now the record is concerned with Sarah, her death, Abraham, his son, getting a bride for his son. Hagar is not in the record anymore. <clears throat> as we know that the record or the law, all the things that we've considered before. So Abraham mourns when she dies being 107 and 20 years old. It's the only time a woman's age is given in the Bible. And the details of, a, of the burying of a woman are given in the Bible. This is it. Because of what she represents and her significance. And as we've said before, she represents Jerusalem related to the Abraham. She dies, we're told specifically, in Kirjath Arba, which means city of four. And we know that principle, all four corners of the earth, all four winds, every nation, kindred, people, and tongue. She is now going, going to become the mother of a multitude. And it's the same name as Hebron. And we know that to mean fellowship. Abraham is mourning her death and he weeps for her. Now, here's what Brother H.B. Mansfield says in the exposition. What Abraham, as we've looked at, is set forth as the believers. He's allegorical, the Abrahamic covenant, the heavenly Jerusalem, and its polity of the faithful, Yahweh's bride. As an organized entity, the heavenly kingdom came to an end in AD 70. and was buried in Gentile lands, awaiting political resurrection. That's what Hebrews 11 says. She did all this in faith, looking for a better resurrection. And Abraham weeps over her. And we have that record of Christ when he rides into Jerusalem, and he mourns that they did not know the times coming upon them. He wept over it. Speaking of the Roman priests, cast a trench about it, and lay it even with the ground, not one stone upon another. So there's a lot of significance in this that we don't have time to detail right now, but I think you can see it pretty clearly. It's not difficult. So we have to remember this. Hath God cast away his people? He has not. Even when dealing with those children after the flesh that embrace the truth, Paul says, I am also. In Israelite, the seed of Abraham. And he goes on to say that there is even a remnant now according to the election of grace. And we know what the period of grace is that is Christ. God hath not cast away his people. There are 7,000, he's referencing Elijah, that have not bowed the knee to Baal. So the sleep of Sarah in the grave, Hagar is gone, is essential for fighting the bride for the son. And the servant of Abraham, we'll consider in a moment, travels out to find this bride. That's what happens in Genesis 24. In the sense of the above, Sarah represents faithful Jews who have rightly embraced the Abrahamic covenant. There was a remnant as it pertains to Israel. But they were subject to the political dissolve of the nation in 8070. In fact... There was a lot of persecution that came upon those Jews that believed. You'll know this from Acts chapter 8. It's not only in Acts chapter 8, but it says the more that they scattered them in persecution, of which, by the way, Paul was foremost, they went about, went about everywhere. I believe this is Acts 8 verse 4, preaching the kingdom. So as the literal Jew was, the gospel went to the Gentiles, and this was the Jew that believed spreading the word. But they were subject to that judgment that came upon the nation in AD 70, just like Jeremiah, Daniel, and faithful men were of old. That's the discussion Abraham has with God. Will I smite the city if there are 50 faithful, 40, 30, 20, 10? So Sarah is the Jerusalem that is the mother of us all, those that embrace the Abrahamic faith. So that's why your death is important. This is what Brother Mansfield says, and I think his section is just phenomenal on this. In the expositor, 
again, Sarah is the only age recorded. The record of the death and burial of a woman is unusual in scripture. And he's right about that. Sarah was no ordinary woman. She was the mother of the long-awaited son of promise, and that's Isaac, which we know as Christ. Paul says that. As Isaac was, that's Christ. The faithful companion of Abraham in all his wanderings, in the terms of Paul's allegory, she represented the Abrahamic covenant according to faith. Jerusalem from above. Originally, that was limited to the nation of Israel. Hagar's gone. But in AD 70, with the overthrow of the Jewish state, this came to an end as far as the national covenant was concerned. That's why there's no more Hagar in the record. And she was buried among the Gentiles, where it has remained ever since. This was foreshadowed in the death and burial of Sarah. So remember what we we're talking about. All the things in scripture that pertain to marriage are usually prophetic. So we're not just talking about a literal event that takes place. We're talking about something that's allegorical and parabolic or prophecy. Gentiles are grafted into the hope of Israel. No longer aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. There's a reason I'm citing this, brothers and sisters. Gentiles have their hope directly related to Israel. Their diminishing resulted in the riches of the Gentiles who now have been grafted in among them. And I'm going to just cite a couple of quick slides here in just a moment to talk about our language and how we refer to Israel today. I am not saying it's inaccurate. I'm saying because it's not necessarily precise Bible language, but there is a bit of confusion about natural Israel and spiritual Israel. Those are not Bible terms, by the way. They're not incorrect in the way that we apply them, but the way that the churches apply them are God is done with Israel as a nation. We're the spiritual Israel. The Catholic Church does that. So Abraham stands up from before his dead, and that word stand up is the same word translated in Scripture to perform the oath made unto the fathers. And there are the references for you. Isn't that interesting? Her death, Abraham st stands up, and the oath and the covenant continues on. And he says something interesting. I am a stranger and a sojourner among you. The Abrahamic covenant has not been realized. Give me a burying place that I may bury my dead out of my sight. And this is the burial of Sarah. And we know that Hosea chapter 6 and Hosea chapter 13 literally, literally use the language in a figurative sense for the nation of Israel ransomed and buried among the grave of the nations. Which, by the way, Hosea is not alone. This is exactly yet Ezekiel 37. That when they are restored, they will come up out of the graves and be brought back to the land of Israel. You shall know, says Yahweh, when I open your graves and put my spirit in you and place you back in your own land. It is a very deep scriptural term, and I know we've talked about this before. <clears throat> Even the death state. We are planted together in the likeness of his death. We've talked about all this before. That the germinating seed of the word and the planting of it. It requires death to bring forth life and the many things that are associated with that. So the planting of Sarah in and among the Gentile lands, like the hope of Israel, and the scattering of the Jews literally led to the enlightenment of the Gentiles. And by the way, brothers and sisters, and I certainly am not the only one to point this out, predominantly the nations where Christadelphians are today predominantly the English-speaking peoples, which are the people that are favorable to the Jews and were kindly treating with them and the nation of Israel, assisting in their restoration as a nation in 1948 and so on. And it's among those nations, predominantly the Christadelphians have been enlightened. There is a natural and a figurative corresponding to that. And he says, I am a stranger and a soldier. 
That is language, brothers and sisters, that he has not inherited the promises. And you will know that from Hebrews 11. I won't take the time to quote it. But we all know that. But he's not possessed the land. He was seeing it afar off. He confessed that he was a stranger and a pilgrim. And with him in that were Isaac and Jacob, dwelling in tents. Their hope was in the same promise. So this is a promise that has not been realized. So Sarah is dead. He seeks a burying place for her. He rises up to perform the oath, same language, and he refers to himself as a stranger and a sojourner because the Abrahamic covenant has not been realized. That, by the way, brothers and sisters, is why we read Genesis 23 when the subject matter is actually Genesis 24 at large today. Something. Here again, from the expositor, the allegory sets forth in proper sequence the events that develop out of the Lord's death at Calvary. Remember, Hagar is not mentioned in the record anymore. The dust has been shaken, and lo, we turn unto the Gentiles. Genesis 21 is the parable or the allegory of the two seeds, that which is born after the flesh and that which is born after the word of God. Chapter 22, the sacrifice of the son. Chapter 23, the overthrow of Jerusalem in AD 70. Sarah buried. Chapter 24, the wife sought for the son of sacrifice. Chapter 25, Abraham takes on concubines. As it will be in the kingdom age. And now the gospel goes out and other nations are affected. We'll look at that very briefly at the end. So Abraham hearkened unto Ephron, and Abraham weighed the silver, 400 shekels of silver. We know that's the medal of redemption. It's called the shekel for atonement under the law and the, the shekel for redemption in Exodus 30, also in other places in Scripture. We know that it represents redemption. We are literally told that. That is the medal of redemption. It's the medal under which the vision in Daniel chapter 2 is given. After the gold, the silver kingdom, that is the Medo-Persian, that's when building rebegins, by the way, begins again to restore Jerusalem. It is a, a restoration medal is what it represents in scripture. And this, just read it on your own time, it'll be in the notes, where I would suggest, brothers and sisters, and I know that Brother Thomas uses this language, not often, but sometimes, and I know that Brother Roberts does. I'm not saying it's wrong. Brother Mansfield does. Many brethren do. I'm saying that the terms natural Israel and spiritual Israel can create confusion. I've had this discussion with a lot of young people years ago. Well, Israel, I don't understand. There is actually one Israel. There are the natural branches that are cut off and the wild branches that are grafted in. There is one root, Abrahamic, that is holy. And sometimes we get that language a little confused. There is Israel after the flesh, and those that are born after the flesh, and those that are born after the spirit, but there's one Israel. There are not, as the churches presume, are two. And Paul says that. They are not all Israel, which are of Israel. And that's chapters 9 through 11. And he talks about the clipping off of some of the branches and the crafting in of the others until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled, and then he's able to graft them back in to their own natural root. So we get a little, I think, a little wobbly with our language, just as it concerns clarity with the terms natural and spiritual in Israel. Again, I'm not saying it inaccurate. Here again is the language of Israel after the flesh, my kinsmen according to the flesh, the two sons, one after the flesh, and the other one that was born after the spirit. And we start modifying the language to natural Israel and spiritual Israel. It can be a little confusing, confusing for some. So when we do Genesis 24, the chapter that we didn't read under consideration, <laughs> we're dealing with Abraham. Of course, he represents the father, the son representing the Lord Jesus Christ. Obviously, the man's sacrifice we considered last week. Rebecca, all the same ecclesia that received the gospel call, and then Abraham's servant, which is the Abrahamic gospel of faith. 
not the one according to the law, but the covenants of promise that is used to retrieve. And figuratively, Isaac becomes the type of Christ. Rebecca, the ecclesia, a spouse to one husband. And Brother Mansfield says, from this viewpoint, we'll understand the seeking of the bride in Gentile lands are really the situation that we're in today. And so we read in the very first verse, and this, brothers and sisters, is why we're so focused on Bible prophecy, which is my understanding next week we'll have a, a prophecy day um, uh, in the UK. This is one of the reasons. We know that when you go back to creation, the Noahic time, the Mosaic time, the times of the prophets, the judges, so on and so forth, the period of the kings, the apostolic age, and then the times of the Gentiles. We know in the framework of God since the beginning, we are at the latter end of that. And that's why we're students of Bible prophecy. And that's why we look at signs of the times and we go, well, that's interesting. We know Abraham's old and he's well stricken in age when these events take place. Now, God foresaw that he would justify the heathen, that all nations and all families would be blessed in Abraham. But we know, according to this principle, for the last 2,000 years, the space of 2,000 cubits, the ark went before the actual entering of the people in the land. That's in Joshua. We're about that 2,000 cubits period. We're at the latter period of this development. So we are the calling of the bride for Isaac. So Abraham says to his eldest servant in his house that ruled over all that he had, put thine hand under my thigh. It means his intimate parts. It's associated with circumcision. I will make thee swear by Yahweh, the God of heaven, the God of earth. Thou shalt not take a wife of the daughters of Canaan among whom I dwell. And we know why that is. And there's a reason, brothers and sisters. Remember again, when I was just talking about the natural Israel spirit, I'm not calling that language false as we correctly understand it. What we believe is no different than what Abraham believed. Genesis 12, that's what we believe. That's what we are called to. Paul says that. When Israel was called out, Hebrews chapter 3, to enter the land promised to the patriarchs, it didn't happen because they had no faith, and they murmured and complained, etc. He goes on into chapter 4 to say, to say in Hebrews chapter 4, unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them. It's the same gospel. You know, the churches try to do that. They try to make the New Testament something totally foreign as to what was proclaimed in the Old Testament. And you and I know the gospel that we receive is the exact same gospel that the patriarchs received and the children of Israel in the wilderness. It's a hope in the land promised to the patriarchs. So he's talking to the oldest servant who's not named, by the way, which is why, of course, even he said to the centurion, many shall come from the east, south, northwest and enter in with Abraham, Isaac and Jacob into the kingdom of God. Because the faith of the centurion was the same as those men. So it's the gospel of the Abrahamic covenant that's for all people of faith. And it's coming now, not named because it's irrelevant, first of all. The truth is about men. I mean, far, pardon me. The truth is about God. It is not about men because it's what he represents. We're not supposed to be confused with who he is. Maybe, maybe Eliezer, don't know. There's a reason he's not made, and he's the eldest servant, because the gospel goes all the way back to the Abrahamic covenant, and he's not to take a fleshly bride. It's not acceptable for the sacrificial son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who is without blemish. But go to my country and my kindred, verse 4, and take a wife there for my son Isaac. It's someone that's got to be related to Abraham. We have to be related to Abraham. And so the servant says, what if she's not willing to come? Should I bring your son down to her? And Abraham said, 
beware. That's the one warning he gives, and it is a strong word. Check it in the Hebrew. If she doesn't listen, that's fine. You're acquitted. But you cannot bring my son down to gratify the flesh. And that is a very important exhortation in these times of the Gentiles, brothers and sisters. We cannot let it become lawlessness. Let sin continue that grace may abound, using it as a cloak of covetousness and a cloak of maliciousness. The call of the gospel is a separation from the world and holding to God. You cannot compromise the standards of the bride to meet the compromised standards of the groom. No. And that's reiterated, by the way, in this account. You will not reduce the standards to satisfy the bride. He says, Yahweh, the God of heaven, that took me from my father's house, from the land of my kindred, which he spake unto me, saying, Under thy seed will I give this land. He will send his angel before thee. We have no record of the angel. It's that silent, as Brother Robert says, in ways of providence. It's that silent providential oversight, which is evident in this chapter. Thou shalt take a wife unto my son from thence. If the woman will not be willing to follow thee, you're clear from my oath. Shake off the dust. And that's what Brother Mansfield says in his expositor. The responsibilities, brothers and sisters, need to be plainly taught. That's not just doctrine, it's lifestyle. If people are discouraged at the high standards of the truth, shall we relax them in order to secure their interests? The answer is in the negative, says Brother Mansfield. Let the standards of the truth be lowered and soon there will be no truth remaining. The teaching of the truth re re requires revealing all the counsel of God. And that does include standards, brothers and sisters. And he's warned not to compromise that. So the servant takes the goods of his master, a camel. That's an unclean animal. That's an unclean animal. Here's the calling to the Gentiles. And he goes to Mesopotamia, Babylon, to the city of Nahor, which means the sleeper. Because he's calling out of her, come out from among Babylon. That's the ecclesia. That's what the term is, called out ones. To those that are in a spiritual slumber, as Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 5, writing to a Gentile ecclesia. And the camel coming down by the well of water at the time of evening, time of the Gentiles, even at the time when the women go to draw water. We meet people based upon... So the servant of Abraham, not mentioned because he represents the Abrahamic hope, goes to well, the well of water. It's the only place we want to meet people. That's it. Purgatory, it's not in the Bible. Trinity, immortal soul, all the ideas that you guys come up, substitution, those are words that are not in the Bible, nor are their ideas. Just meet me at the water of the word, and I, if you're honest, you will become a Christadelphian. If you're honest with what the word says, you will embrace the Abrahamic covenant, and you will become a brother or sister in Christ. And we're all coming out of that Babylonian system that has made all of Christianity and the kings of the earth drunk with the wine of her fornication to the city of the sleeper. And it's there he's going to enlighten her because all he wants is to find someone at the well. That's all we're asking for. And we talk the truth with someone. I stand here by the well of water. And the daughters come out to draw the water. Let it come to pass, he prays, the damsel who will let down the pitcher. And then also give my camels drink, not just myself. Let that same one be appointed for thy servant, Isaac. Now, Isaac, he says, thereby, I will know that you will show kindness to my master. So the father is the master and Isaac is called the servant. And that's Christ. 
the sacrificial son. He is called Yahweh's righteous servant that took upon him the form of humility and of a servant, Philippians 2, Isaiah 53, because Yahweh could only be glorified by a servant. And to let down the pitcher literally means to incline the ear and to bow down in humility. And that's all we're asking for. It's all you and I had to do to come to the truth. It's all we're asking for when we talk to people in the world, brothers and sisters. Will they humbly incline their ear to the water of the word? Yeah, but my church, all due respect, I don't care what your church says. I don't care about its organization. I don't care what I say. I'm talking about the Bible. Well, I know, but all these churches, they all can't be wrong. I'm not talking about them. I'm not talking about me. The Bible. That's all we care about. The Bible. We bow to its authority only. And it doesn't make any difference if it's Babylon or the city of the sleeper. That's where the bride is going to be found. And before he had done speaking, and I believe absolutely, brothers and sisters, it is a metaphor be representing the response of her to what was preached. Before he had done speaking, Rebecca came out, come out from her and be ye separate. Mesopotamia, the place of the sleeper. And lo and behold, she's related to Abraham. And she was very fair, a virgin. Neither had she known any man. That's exactly the description given to the saints in the apocalypse. And by the way, also, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 2, from the Apostle Paul. And it says she was born in Bethuel. Now, Bethuel means destroyed of God. By the way, Rebecca means ensnared. Fetters representing shackled by sin. I've not come to call the righteous, said Christ. The gospel call is to take people who were servants of sin and lust and turn them in to a bride of Christ. You wouldn't even want to know my days in Gentile past, and they're irrelevant. They were full of whatever I wanted to do with myself. That's why we don't testify and give testimonials of the truth. They're irrelevant. The Bible, by the way, doesn't fill itself with that. It doesn't matter. If someone inclines their ear to the word, they can become the seed of Abraham and the bride of Christ. So the servant runs to me. She hastens and looks, pets down the, the pitcher and gives drink. And she hastens and runs again. There's speed involved here. There's enthusiasm. There's urgency. There's running with patience the race that is set. There's a matter of urgency involved here. It's not someone that's lackadaisical in the things that were introduced to them. He's not lackadaisical in his duty. It also represents doing something with joy. That's what it says. The running of both of them in verses 28, 29 again. And the man wonders at her and he holds his peace. The prayer has been made. While he was yet speaking, she came. The testing ground is the well of water. He just holds his peace. Will she respond? Brothers and sisters, we don't know. And sometimes the still small voice has to do its work. We don't know. We don't know if it'll work. Just let it sit for a moment. Sometimes people, we've all heard stories of this. And they come to the knowledge of the truth and they respond to it many years later. Just let it sit. So she fulfills her requirements, gave the camel's drink also. He takes a golden earring and two bracelets. Her response and her tried faith has been manifested. And he realizes she is of Abraham's kindred. And so 
he is invited to lodge with them. That's interesting. Now we move down to verse 33. He's interested in lodging with them. And then a table and food is set before him. But he doesn't eat. Notice what it says. There was set meat before him to eat, verse 33. But he said, I will not eat until I told you my tidings. Spare. And he said, speak on. Slave him. And he said, I am Abraham's servant. And we know what eating represents. Literally, as they were eating, Jesus took the bread, blessed it, and drank it. If any man that you keep company with be called a brother, 1 Corinthians 5, verse 11, in his idolatry, covetousness, so a thief, drunkard, so on, don't eat. Same thing in 2 John. Eating represents fellowship. He establishes himself as the servant of Abraham first. First. <clears throat> There's no fellowship until that principle is understood. And Yahweh, he says, bless my master greatly, and he has become great. And Sarah, Sarah enters into the record here. Sarah, the Abrahamic covenant, not the Mosaic covenant, not Hagar. The Abrahamic covenant bare a son to my master when she was old. And unto him, the father has given everything. At his first advent, he had the spirit without measure. At his death and ascension, all power is given unto him. Angels, powers, all judgment, excuse me, all rulership in the age to come. All things come unto him. That's the reference point that the servant gets. Now, here's something that is very unusual in scripture. By the way, you get this in Acts chapter 10 and 11 with Peter enlightening the Gentile Cornelius you get a very lengthy repeat of the very lengthy chapter of Acts chapter 10. Why? In these verses, you get a very lengthy repeat from Abraham's servant of what has transpired. Why? The Bible very rarely does that. It just says, and then he repeated or he spoke unto him all the things that were said unto him, so on and so forth. But here you actually have a record of what he stated again. And I believe, brothers and sisters, it represents the very important principle that we maintain the faith throughout the generations. So that the word from Abraham to the servant, now all of this time later, proclaimed to the Gentile bride and the Gentiles has not changed at all. And enlightening Cornelius in Acts chapter 10 and 11, I believe it's also, and I think the notes say that, that I had on those study series. It's so that we don't change the truth as we received it. And I will tell you an insert here, brothers and sisters. That's why I have a very, very disappointing attitude, personally speaking. When brethren introduce false doctrine in the brotherhood, because they have not taught it as they received it. When we get an Arab theory or we get some sort of weird prophetic thing or we get a different view on the atonement or we now have theistic evolution. Somebody introduced that into our community of something that was not handed to them. They introduced something that was not given to them from the person that taught them. And they brought it into the community. And I think that's why that is recorded in detail here. So Laban and Bethuel answered, and the thing proceeded from Yahweh. We cannot speak thee bad or good. Man's opinions do not matter. If you meet at the well of water and this man recites back verbatim what had happened. Verbatim. 
what had happened. Well, I think the Bible, well, well, what do you think the Bible teaches regarding the state of the dead? With all due respect, what I think is irrelevant. I can tell you what the Bible says regarding the state of the dead and when the resurrection will happen. But what do you think happens to us if we don't go to heaven? If I can tell you what the Bible says, what I think is irrelevant. There was a covenant made to Abraham. His seed will inherit the earth, so on and so forth. Our opinion is irrelevant. Behold, Rebecca is before thee. Let her be thy master's son's wife. Rebecca is tied to the master and the master's son, to Yahweh and his anointed. As Yahweh had spoken, were only begotten by the word. Isaac was begotten by the word. The bride is begotten by the word. It came to pass when Abraham's servant heard these words, he worshiped Yahweh. The servant brought forth jewels of silver, gold, raiment. She now changed. She's from Christ. He gave them to Re Rebekah, to her brother and her family. And then it says in verse 54, and then they ate together. That's when fellowship is enjoyed, brothers and sisters. When we doctrinally agree, before that clarity was made, <clears throat> excuse me, it's very dry and dealing with allergies today. Before that doctrine was solidified and repeated verbatim, and the purpose of his errand, his tidings was known, received by Rebecca, received by the house, the Abrahamic call, he would not eat. And then when he does, he tarries with them all night through Gentile darkness. And so, you know, there's more to the record here, brothers and sisters. We move down in verse 59. So they sent away Rebecca, their sister, and her nurse with her. With Abraham's servant and his men. There's a company of men with Abraham's servant. And Rebecca's not alone. She has a nurse. We've talked about this before, brothers and sisters. The milk of the law. The milk of the oracles. Christ never negated the law. Yea, we established the law through grace, says Paul. There is absolutely a need to study the law to understand who Messiah is. It's not negated. She, as a Gentile bride, <clears throat> to understand Christ needs to study the law, just like the Jews had to know. And look what they say. If you have any question, brothers and sisters, whatsoever, that Rebecca represents the saints, they blessed Rebecca and said, Thou art the mother of thousands of millions. Let thy seed possess possess the gate of them which hate thee. Note the margin in your Bible. If you have a Cambridge, you're in Oxford. That phrase, thousands of millions, is literally in all the references that we have supplied there for you. The same phrase that appears, 10,000 of saints in Deuteronomy 33. David is slain as 10,000s. The ten thousands, that is a number specifically that is marked for the saints. It says that in Jude. Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied that the Lord would come with ten thousand of his saints. This word, thousands of millions, is literally the same word, ten thousands in the scripture. So if we have any questions, that Rebecca represents the redeemed saints, you have it there. The margin has some notation to that. And to that effect, and you can check me on this, brothers and sisters. And by the way, her name appears 12 times in this chapter. Then we know that 12 is directly associated with Israel. He set up 12 pillars according to the tribes of Israel. The priest had 12 stones on his breastplate to represent the 12 tribes of Israel. When you shall reign with me, Christ said to the 12 uh, disciples, you shall sit upon 12 thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. 
12 is directly related to Israel. And isn't that what Galatians goes on to say? Those that are baptized in Christ, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision, but a new creature, they are the Israel of God. Here's the 10,000, brothers and sisters. Those that receive the gospel call, which is the covenant of Abraham, who've, been, who've come out of Mesopotamia and a state of sleep, Nahor, and embrace the hope of Israel, knowing that they have got to be servants to a master, a father, and a spouse to be the bride of the son that was sacrificed by the father. That's the Israel of God. That's the 10,000 of saints. Responding to Abraham's servant, the gospel, this espoused bride begins a journey like you and I have to meet a husband she has never met. She's never met him. We've never met Christ. And that's what it says. Though you have not, you love him. First Peter 1, 3 through 9 talks about that and other pieces of scripture. Though we have not met him, not seen him, we love him. She travels on this journey, being enlightened by the servant of Abraham, to marry a man she's never met, based strictly on faith and the doctrine that has been preached to her. Then Isaac came from the way to the well of Lego Rock. Now that's where he met her. That's where the servant of Abraham met the would-be bride, is at the well. But this well means the well of the living one. Everything that she studied about in the well of the water of the word, the scriptures, brothers and sisters, that we study all the time, is manifested in the one. And here he is. Isaac goes to a place that is called the well of the living one. And we know that Christ talks about himself being the living waters, the one. Everything that she studied in the well of water is now to be manifested in the groom that she's about to marry. He is the well of the living one. Here's a manifestation of all the principles of scripture. And he goes into the field at eventide. And that means the period where it's dark. Yet he lifted up his eyes and saw. And then it says, verse 64, she lifted up her eyes and saw him. Because that's what the word is. It's light in a dark place. It's comprehension of divine things, even though the world is filled with darkness. And she's approaching him. So she can see his approach coming near. And by the way, if you were to back up in verse 61, I don't know why we didn't quote it here in the notes. Verse 61 says, so Rebecca departed and her damsels. She's a multitudinous bride. She's not alone. We know the nurse is with her. And then it says in verse 61, damsels are with her. She is a person represented here in an allegorical sense, but she's a multitudinous bride. And she lied off of the camel. You and I both know under the law, that is an unclean animal. She's a bride. Sarah has fallen asleep. 80, 70. Abraham has rose up to perform the oath and sent his servant to find a bride, and she comes and returns and lighted off a camel. It's predominantly a Gentile bride. The servant told Isaac all the things that she'd done. And here again, brothers and sisters, it's why we began the reading with Genesis 23, the death of Sarah. She's the reference point. 
Notice what it says in verse 67. Isaac brought her into Sarah's tent and took Rebekah and she became his wife and he loved her. When? And Isaac was comforted after his mother's death. Sarah is the reference point. The changing of her name is a multitude. Her falling asleep. The rising up to perform the oath. She represents the Abrahamic covenant. Hagar's gone. The law had fulfilled its purpose. And the servant of Abraham sent out to get a bride. And to bring her back, and she lights off a camel as a multitudinous cry, having met at the well, to see the one of the living well, he brings her into the tent of Sarah. And what is Sarah? It's the polity of the heavenly Jerusalem, says Paul in Galatians 4. Ye are come unto a heavenly Jerusalem, Hebrews 12 to an innumerable company of angels, to the ecclesia of the firstborn of saints. That word innumerable in Hebrews 12, same word translated 10,000 in the Bible. Same word translated 10,000 in the Bible. It's the Rebecca seed. Typically, Sarah represents the covenant of Abraham, the Jerusalem from above. Politically manifested in Israel is the kingdom of God. It came to an end in AD 70 when it opened up the way for the Gentiles to be incorporated within the multitudinous bride and to assume the position once enjoyed by Israel. Remember what Christ said? A nation bringing forth fruits. The kingdom shall be taken from you. And it says in the next chapter, Isaac was 40 years old when he took Rebekah to wife. 40 years old. Period of probation is over. And Paul tells us in Ephesians chapter 5, the whole concept of marriage is a great mystery I speak concerning Christ in the Ecclesia. That's a quote from Ephesians 5. Speaking of a marriage, I'm speaking of a great mystery. It doesn't make any difference if it's an allegory. Galatians 4, Abraham received Isaac from the dead in a figure. Hebrews 11, it's the same word parable. Or if it's the mystery of Isaac and Rebekah, Christ in the Ecclesia of Ephesians 5. We know the Bible is recorded after this pattern. They're literal events that are allegorical, parabolic, or mystical in their approach. They have a secondary reading of which the enlightened can comprehend. So here's this innumerable company of angels coming to the heavenly Jerusalem, which is Sarah, as Isaac brings her into her tent and he's comforted. And here's where it concludes, brothers and sisters. It's not over. It's you and I at Zion with the Lord Jesus Christ when finally this long espoused period will be realized in a marriage. Is that the end? It isn't. The beginning of the kingdom age has concubines. Not the bride, but concubines. It begins with then again Abraham took a wife, and she bare Medan and Midian and Zimram and Joshkan. Abraham gave all that he had to Isaac, but to the sons of the concubines, which Abraham had, he gave gifts and sent them away from Isaac his son while he yet lived eastward under the east country. Here's what Brother Mansfield says. Abraham had another wife, Keturah, bearing six sons. Though these descendants, the promise that Abraham would be the father of many nations in the age to come was typically fulfilled. Nevertheless, 
The superior rights go to Isaac. It's the true son were preserved in that whilst Abraham gave gifts to all the son, the residue forming the major portion was given to Isaac. So that, brothers and sisters, is I think we can all see, beginning in Genesis 21 through Genesis 25 is the allegory of Abraham's life. And I don't think it's difficult to understand if we just read the scriptures and we take the literal and we extract from it the parabolic. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. We hope you found the episode helpful. Don't forget, most of these episodes are also available as videos on our video channel, cdvideo.org. So head over and take a look. If you have any comments or questions or suggestions, please get in touch or leave us a voice message. We love to hear your feedback. You can email us at bt f at cdvideo.org if you enjoyed the episode then please share it with others until next time may god bless you in your studies and your walk towards god's kingdom amen